Thank you for holding these hearings on climate change, Senator Kaminsky, Metzger, and other legislators. I'm Pramila Mullick, the chair of Protect Orange County, an all-volunteer, all-grassroots frontline community organization representing over 300,000 New York residents in Orange County. I'm here on Valentine's Day solely out of love and concern for the children of this great state, the planet, and the livable future they have a right to. Today I'll talk about why the CCPA is deeply flawed, why the governor's new Climate Leadership Act is actually better but needs to be stronger, and why our community is uniquely impacted by the decisions you'll make. Orange County is largely an agricultural district, interspersed with commuter communities and three struggling cities comprised mostly of low-income environmental justice communities. We're home to many New York City first responders and serve uh, the city's farmers markets as well. We're also a community that stands on the precipice of a climate and public health catastrophe. So this policy will directly impact us more than any others. Today, we are held hostage by New York's newest frac gas power plant, the infamous CPV Valley Project, built by Competitive Power Ventures, whose company executive was just convicted of bribing state official Joe Percoco. To facilitate this project and to quote, and I'm quoting the indictment, shape New York State's energy policy. Now any climate bill that is passed will determine our fate. Because climate policy is really energy policy. Indeed, two prominent climate scientists in Grafia and Howarth conservatively, conservatively estimated that CPV overnight would increase the state's greenhouse gas emissions by 10% of the um, electric sector. 10% um, when we have deadly floods, droughts, and wildfires around the world. Built to serve New York City, the second largest consumer of power in the world, locking us into fracked gas dependency for the next 40 years, CPV is now operational. So today, New York State has become a culprit in the climate crisis. This is a failure of our entire state government. And by the way, we are still waiting for the environmental and oversight hearings that we've been asking all of you for on this project. Indeed, our state's use of frac gas is expanding rapidly. And we've learned an important lesson that the cause of our climate crisis is really corruption. This is what happens when you let politics poison policy. We can't afford to take the wrong road at this critical fork. We cannot afford a climate bill like CCPA riddled with loopholes, ambiguous language with bait and switch provisions. We cannot allow politicos and special interest groups to write bills that should be based on science and only science. <laughs> the laws of physics do not pander to political agendas, and neither must you. This is exactly the type of cynical politics that created CPV. Now, most of you have already been informed by these loopholes by scientific experts, but for the record, I'll give you all a copy of a detailed letter once again describing them. Let's take one example. CCPA tells the public that it will get 100% reductions in greenhouse gases by 2050. No, it doesn't, because the loopholes, uh, because of the loopholes that could ignore most emissions. And why are we counting greenhouse gases from 1990 levels, misleading the public into thinking that we're actually going to reduce levels from where we are today? We all know that carbon counting can be fudged. It's a sham. Another example, the CCPA gives credit to emission sources for past emissions reductions, allowing them to delay or be exempted from their reduction requirements. So a plant like CPV could theoretically, be exempted, claiming falsely that since they replaced coal plants, they already reduced emissions, even though they actually increased them by 10%. While the bill calls for 50% renewables by 2030, it says nothing about what happens after 2030. The most critical time frame, since, since as we electrify everything, we'll need considerable more power generation. 
To ensure that this is fossil free, we must put a lock box on all climate funds only for projects that directly solve the climate crisis. CCPA seeks to raid REGI and other climate funds, arbitrarily setting aside 40% for environmental justice communities. This means, and, and jeopardizing their own greenhouse gas emissions goal, this means that selected communities might you know, get a new uh, playground with some new solar panels, um, but kids like ours uh, who have poisoned air will still never be able to play in those playgrounds uh, because the renewable energy never gets built and our communities continue to be polluted. I can assure you that as a mother whose children are poisoned by toxic greenhouse gases, my number one priority is halting the harm. This is a picture of my daughter who gets nosebleeds from exposure to the power plant and a compressor station, like many of our, the children in our community. Indeed, um, the, conditions place, the conditions placed on renewable developers are onerous and will disincentivize renewable investments, as you heard the person from the solar industry trade group just say. For the record, we have 14 environmental justice communities exposed to harmful CPV pollution as I speak. The good news is we now have something somewhat better than CCPA, though still not strong enough, the Government's Climate Leadership Act. Now no one has been more at odds with this governor than I have. But I have to follow the science. His two mandates combined one, that all load-serving entities must be carbon-free by 2040, and two, 70% renewables by 2030 are more clear and strong than CCPA. They're unambiguous, enforceable, again, unlike CCPA. I realize that there's a lot of political pressure on you right now, but I ask you to be bold and brave, and the science and the history will defend you. Reject the flaws in the CCPA and support a climate bill informed by independent experts, not written by special interest groups. True hope, the only hope for our children, lies in the crack in between climate denial and climate deception. Thank you. Thanks. Pramila, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, so the main, the, the provisions in the governor's proposal that, that you support or think are stronger are just those targets, or are there other aspects of it? I mean, there's other aspects of it. One of the problems with the CCPA is that it places all of the decision making on the DEC. And if anybody's been following our eagles in Orange County, you know that we cannot trust the DEC alone. Um, the governor's bill um, puts a responsibility both on NYSERDA as well as the DEC, and that seems to be a better approach. Uh, because it is, in fact, climate policy, as I said, is really energy policy. And the governor's bill also refers to the state energy plan. CCPA doesn't do that. So there are many ways in which um, the governor's bill is better. I would like to see a much stronger bill. I actually do support um, some of the provisions of the OFF Act as well and, and more ambitious goals. Uh, but I think, I think, you know, we're talking about a time frame that is shortening as we speak. A lot of people think that the time frame is 11, 12 years. I have to tell you, our scientific experts, our climate experts testified at our civil disobedience trial, and they said three years, three years to turn this ship around. Does anyone have any questions? Have a question. Um, thank you for your passionate uh, testimony. Um, I just was curious, with your daughter, yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you for your passionate testimony. With your daughter, and I'm really sorry to hear of her nosebleeds, is something you can trace definitely? Like? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we um, participated in a study mm -hmm. led by a group called the Environmental Health Project where they okay. monitored um, emissions in Minisync, uh, which uh, was one of the first communities in New York to you know, fight a compressor station. Um, and then they monitored health impacts along with met, um, actually taking air samples. And we were able to coordinate peaks in particulate matter exposure with reports of health impacts. And out of a, a group of about, I think there were about 10 children in the study, mm -hmm. about seven or eight of them started getting nosebleeds, especially during the times of the peaks. And so what we have to understand that um, a, a compressor station, everybody knows now, has toxic gases. Mm -hmm. And we talk about methane, but um, uh, 
The co-constituents of methane are also very toxic chemicals like volatile organic compounds, benzenes, known carcinogens, and that's what scientists believe are causing the nosebleeds. Uh, methane also um, uh, interacts with sunlight and a byproduct is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is also the other constituent that scientists are believe uh, are causing the nosebleeds. But these are all carcinogenic. Right. Yes. Um, constituents. And how close do you live to the I'm, nearest bio uh, power plant? About a, well, so about seven or eight miles from the power plant, okay. about a quarter mile from the compressor station. So we have two compounding sources of pollution in a, mind you, was once a pristine agricultural district. Um, but um, but the um, we've also started doing monitoring of the power plant because the power plant's now operational. And we've gotten reports of health impacts from as far away as 15 miles wow. in New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Montgomery. We've, we've gotten them from quite far distances. And it's because it, the way it was sited, at, literally at the bottom of the valley, which is one of the reasons why we need those hearings um, to, to get to the bottom of, of those decisions. OK, well, thank you very much. That's really important, valuable, meaningful information. Thank you. Right.